in second and third John, well at least second John. We might get to third John, but I'm not promising anything. Uh, we will finish our reading here in just a few weeks of reading the New Testament together five, at least five times a week. Uh, that we've been doing that this year, you realize it's almost done. You've almost done it. If you've been keeping up with it, uh, you've read the New Testament through five times uh, in a year. At the end of November, uh, you'll have done that. And those of you who have been going the extra mile, you've done it seven times in one year, which is outstanding. And uh, just look forward to uh, diving into Second John tonight, and want to just get right into it so we can cover as much as we can. Uh, Second John is is one of the books that we don't study uh, very often, do we? First John is one of our favorites, but Second and Third John, because they're so short, uh, sometimes you can overlook those little books of the Bible. But Second and Third John, there's some powerful messages in here, and hopefully we'll be able to see this tonight. Uh, in the introduction, we're not going to do much. Uh, if you want to do some deeper research on your own, uh, that would probably be good, uh, especially to find out more about uh, the authorship and authenticity and all of those good things. We're not going to touch much on that. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and tell you that the author of the book is John. It is John, and we could prove that by doing several things, but don't want to uh, get into that so much tonight. But you notice... It is John who identifies himself as the elder, as the elder, not just elder, but the elder. And the emphasis on this is on the person, it's not on a title or a position, he's not talking about his office of an elder, uh, he's talking about his age. Look at uh, 2 John verse 1, the elder to the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. So, here you have a man, later in life, he's writing to people that he loves, and look how he identifies himself, the elder, the old man, the older man. He was old as far as years went, and it was like he was writing as a father, or grandfather would write to his children or grandchildren and counseling them. Uh, there is a, in one of my old Bibles, and I kept it in there because that's the Bible I was using when my grandmother died, uh, I kept the last letter she ever wrote to me. And it was really interesting uh, seeing some of those things in there as I go back and look at it. A lot of it was just... Um, How's your basketball season going? And she talked a little bit about her treatments that she was going through for uh, the cancer that she had. And she talked a little bit about that. But most of it was about, I miss you guys. Look forward to seeing you. Tell your mom and dad and brother and sister I said hi. And, you know, appreciate you. For, you know, all those kinds of things that you would see. And that's a special letter for many reasons. Well, here is a letter, something like that. You have an older man writing to some people. That he loves. And the people are identified in here to the elect lady and her children. The elect lady and her children. Some say that the words elect lady are actually a proper name, proper noun, identifying a person. Some have said, well, it's electa, the lady. And then others have chosen the latter part, um, electra chiera identifying her and calling this person, well, that was her name. I don't know about all of that, but some say that's when she's talking, when he's talking to this person, that's actually a proper name. Others have said that this is being used figuratively to talk about the church. And I'll go ahead and tell you, there's a lot of people who do, probably a lot more that don't, but there's a lot of people that think that this is figuratively talking about the church. He's talking about this elect lady and he's using, using figurative language to talk about the church overall. Well, I don't necessarily buy into that and uh, I'll tell you why. They say he's talking about a local congregation and then in verse 13 he's talking about uh, a sister congregation that's located somewhere else. And here's one of the reasons, not because Guy N. Wood said it, but 
I like the way he put it, and he could put it better than I did. But listen to this. If the lady that we're talking about here, the one to whom he is writing, the elect lady, if the lady was the church, who were the children of the lady? Look what it says. To the elect lady and her children. So if the elect lady is talking about the church, then who are the children? The church has no existence apart from those who constitute its membership. The elect lady had a sister who also had children, verse 13, on the assumption that the elect lady was the church and her children members of the church, who then was the sister, and what did she and her children represent? So you see what you have to do if you think this is figurative language, and perhaps, you know, like I say, there are some who believe this, Uh, then you have to ask yourself, okay, who's the lady and who are her children? And then he goes on to say, from all the facts in the case, the preponderance of evidence seems logical to lead to the conclusion that the terms under consideration are to be literally interpreted that the elect lady was some faithful sister known to John. And that's what I think as well, that we're talking about an actual lady who had actual children, Uh, some of whom were faithful, at least some of whom were faithful. And so he's talking to somebody, an individual lady, and this is the letter, the personal letter that he writes to her, and of course expecting it to be read to other people as well. But look at verse 2. Let's read the rest of verse 1 and then verse 2. That was the introductory part. I told you we wouldn't spend much time on this because I want to get to this next part that we're going to start with now. Whom I love... In truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth. Because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. What was the reason for the bond? Just from those two verses, you've seen something. What was the reason for their strong bond? Did you pick up on it? Let me read it again. To the elect lady and her children whom I love in, what's the next word? Truth. And not only I, but also all those who have known the truth because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. What was that bond that drew them together? It was the Bible. It was the truth. The truth dwelt both in Him and in them. And that's that common bond. Do you ever stop and think for a moment Just how powerful, of course, we think about truth uh, leading us to salvation, and of course, that's important. But have you ever thought about the overall power of just truth? Here we are in a building tonight, and all over the world there are people in similar buildings, or maybe some, well, they would have already met because it's tomorrow in some of these countries I'm thinking about. But you have these people from all walks of life, maybe meeting under a coconut tree. Yes, I've worshipped underneath a coconut tree before. From all walks of life, what is it that brings them together? You've got doctors, and you've got ditch diggers, all coming in. Now you think about it, in actual life, where else would these people's paths cross? Probably wouldn't be at the country club, would it? The doctor might be there, but the ditch digger's not going to be there. But the truth is what brings us all together. You ever stop to think about the bond that truth builds between people who, worldly speaking, have no business having interaction with each other? But the truth does that. And John starts off with that in showing that that's the reason. The truth that dwelt both in them and in Him. And this is what we're going to talk about. And it also describes the reason for the love of each faithful disciple to all other disciples. It's that truth, that commonality. You know, when you're going shopping, grocery shopping, and you run into a brother or a sister from another congregation, or maybe from even this congregation, uh, that's special, isn't it? You see somebody you know who's another member of the church? Oh, that person's over a member over at Germantown. That person's a member at Collierville. Or 
that's my brother or that's my sister that worships with me at Forest Hill. There's that common bond that you have. And it just feels good to be out and about and see a brother in Christ, doesn't it? And I don't know if you appreciate that as much as you should. And I'm not saying anything bad about you. But if you came from where I came, uh, you never saw another Christian, very rarely, unless you intentionally went to their house, they came to your house or whatever, except on Sunday or Wednesdays. Because the church is smaller up in that area and it goes even further and it's smaller even in there. You know, there's some places in the United States people drive two hours to go to, to worship. You think they're going to run into other Christians all about town? But when they do, it's something extra special, isn't it? It's that truth that, that I know, you know, we both believe in Jesus. We were both baptized into Him. We both had our sins washed away through Him. And we both try to live like Him. Yeah, I know you know we got that bond together. And there it is. But here's the next question. Only those, this is not the question, let me just set it up like this. Only those who have love for the truth, love in truth. Let me repeat that. Only those who have love for the truth, love in truth. Tell me what you think I mean by that. Only those who have a love of the truth, really love in truth. Anybody know? Give it a, give it a whirl. There it is. That's it. Now let's prove it. That's exactly right. That's what I'm saying. Now let's make sure that we're talking about the truth. What is truth? This is the next thing. And man, I'm going to tell you something right now. I was telling Krista earlier today, I came out of the office, I said, man, Second John walked all over me today. <laughs> and it will. And watch what it does here. Cedric, you hit it right on the head. Let's look at a couple passages. Look, look at John chapter 1, verse 14. Since we have the same author, Look at John chapter 1, verse 14. And I know these are passages that you know as well, but I'm building up towards something. John 1, 14. And the Word, who's the Word? Christ became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and what? Truth. Let me ask you something. Did grace exist before Christ came into the world? What did Noah find? in the eyes of the Lord. He found grace, didn't he? Did truth exist before Jesus came into the world? Was there truth in the Old Testament? Well, yeah, there was truth. There was commands, so there had to be truth, right? So if there was grace and there was truth, then what made it more special when Jesus came into the world full of grace and truth? The fulfillment of it. All right. So in order to know what love is, in order to know what truth is, in order to know what grace is, then who do I need to know? I need to know Jesus, don't I? Let's go a little bit further. Go to John chapter 14. John 14. These are one of those Bible studies, guys, and you'll see this as you're preparing it. You're thinking, man, I should have waited and just preached this. So get ready for a sermon. John 14, verse 6. Another passage we know well. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No, man, no one comes to the Father except through me. Who is truth? Jesus is truth. He says that He was, that He is. Drop down to verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, He who believes in me, the works that I do... He will do also, and greater works than these He will do, because I go to my Father. Don't miss that. Most assuredly, I say to you, He who believes in me, what will He do? The works that I do, He will do also. If you know Jesus, if you believe in Jesus, if you love Jesus, then you love the truth, and if you love Jesus and the truth, what will you do? You'll do what he did. Go a little bit further. Chapter 14, verse 23. 
Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. If you love Jesus, what will you do? You'll keep his word. Does it sound like love and truth involves more than just saying, I love the truth, I love the Lord? Did you see some action verbs in those passages that we just read? Surely we did. Go back to 2 John. I saw still setting us up for something. The truth involves doing. Go back to 2 John now. Look at verse 4. This is where it starts getting powerful, even more powerful. He says, I rejoiced greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we received commandment from the Father. I have found. That word, that phrase, I have found, is perfect active indicative. And we get our English word eureka from it. When would somebody, back in the old days, when would they yell eureka? If they found gold, yeah, California better know that. <laughs> eureka! We found gold. We found what we've been looking for. We have observed something that we've been working for, looking for, and hoping to find. We found it. I have found. I have found. And so that word and that phrase suggests that John had the opportunity to see these people walking in truth. He observed them Walking in truth. Don't miss this. He observed them walking in truth. Now here's the question. How can one observe another walking in truth? What does it look like? And I want answers on this. I don't want to just be asking. This is not a rhetorical question. And I know, you know, this is an auditorium class and, and it's more difficult to try to get class participation. But I want to hear this. What do you think? Walking in truth looks like. If he can see it, if he can observe it, which he just said that he can, I was thrilled, in the Mark Reynolds version, I was thrilled to find, to see, to observe you and your children walking in truth. So my question is, what would walking in truth look like? The Christian life. Let's go a little bit further with that. Okay, tell me what the Christian life is. What do, what do you think that is? Obeying God's commands. That's it. And that's a good starting place. Okay, how about this? Was anybody here that there the day I was baptized? Let's do this because none of you were. None of you there. And I wasn't there. I'm trying to look around. I don't think I was there the day any of you were baptized. So we, I obeyed, you obeyed the truth. We talk about obeying the gospel, obeying the truth. And what do we usually mean by that? Well, they were baptized into Christ. They've obeyed the gospel. They've obeyed the truth. But since you and I weren't around each other, then what are some of the ways, what's it look like to see you walking in truth? Living the Christian life, obeying God's commands. Both of those are exactly right. Tell me, a uh, for instance. There it is. They saw them loving one another. And so that comes, you're getting ahead, but that's okay. How do you see somebody loving somebody else? What did you say, Chris? Okay. And what's that look like? Just give me a for instance. Meeting the needs of others. All right taking care of orphans and widows. And you can observe those types of things, can't you? Uh, and we could go a little bit further with this. And, you know, I, part of me was wanting to just use uh, examples of, of people that I've observed walking in truth, uh, even in this room. But I'm not going to do that because I don't want to embarrass anybody. But you see these people walking in truth. Let's go a little bit further with that. Well, what does it look like? 
Notice that walking in truth denotes not only action, but habitual action and progress towards a goal. Walking in truth denotes not only action, but habitual action. Far too often, when we talk about truth, what do we think of as truth? It's this thing that I have to understand, and then once I understand that, then I know truth. I have truth. I understand truth. But does just understanding truth mean that I'm walking in truth? Let's go a little bit further before we ask that question. Look at the next part. Uh, Verse 5, And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. Refreshing old commandments, that we love one another. That's all the way back to the Old Testament, isn't it? Not teaching you anything new. We've always were told to love one another. Go with me to John chapter 13. And I want us to notice something again here. That walking in truth is observable. Did you know love is observable? Again, a lot of times we think, Cedric, go ahead. That's all right, as long as I don't forget where I was going, which is quite possible. Go ahead, brother. That's it. it. He's reading Romans 12, 10, and honor preferring one another. And that's it. That's that's where you see. That's where you're able to see. Look at John chapter 14. I'm sorry, John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. And watch, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Is love... Just a feeling in the mind or a feeling in the heart, a feeling in the pit of your stomach. Is that what love is? How does Mindy know that I love her? I can tell her and I can show her. Now what do you think means more in the long run in a marriage? Just telling people that you love them or showing that you love them? Do you know love is an observable thing? People will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Somebody have something? Alright, let's keep going. Look at verse 6. I just want us to know that it's observable. Verse 6, again, going back to 2 John. This is love that we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning... You should walk in it. Walking according to His commandments. Now, how can this be visible? Let's go back and think about where we've been. Who is truth? We talked about it in John chapter 14. He just plain out said it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Who is the truth? Jesus Christ is the truth. Okay, Keep that in mind. And read verse 6 with me again. This is love that we walk according to His commandments, that this is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. So we talk about obeying His commandments, obeying the truth. When I obey the truth, then who is my life being patterned after? If Jesus is the truth, who is my life being patterned after? Jesus Christ. You think that's observable? It better be. Walking in truth is not just a cerebral exercise, but it's something that you can observe. It's something that you can see. It's something that changes your character. It changes your actions. It's something that you can visibly see. Now, 
I might not be able to just pick up on it right away, but if I know you for very long and if I watch your life, if I see how you act, then I'll be able to see it. Now, here's the question, and this is the one that walked all over me. And I want you to know, there's no such thing in one way as personal truth. That's, that's garbage. I think you guys probably learned about that today. So that's not what I'm talking about here. You know, you have your truth, I have my truth, we'll just agree to disagree. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is what we've been studying tonight. The truth. And here's the question. Personally speaking, how does your spoken truth compare to your lived truth? And buddy, this is the one that a Christian needs to think about. That a person needs to think about. How does your spoken truth... Oh yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. What do you need to know? Let me tell you what all about it. Let me tell you what you need to do. You need to do this. Why? Because that's what the Bible says. Not a thing wrong with doing that, by the way. You're going to bust hell wide open. You can live live in the way that you live. That's what the Bible says. I don't think I'd go that far. (laughs) But is speaking the truth alone the measuring stick to see if you've arrived at being like Christ? So again, the question, how does your spoken truth compare to your lived truth? How does that compare with the way that you actually live? And that's probably a question we need to ask ourselves on a continual basis, isn't it? Talk about the fruits of the Spirit. The way that Jesus lived His life. You know, one of the things, and maybe I'm just getting soft in my old age, (laughs) but some of the most intelligent people I know who know more Bible than I'll ever know can be some of the meanest people I know. They can speak the truth. but they don't live it. I don't want to be that guy, do you? I want to know the truth. Yes, I want to know it in my mind, but I want to be able to live it. Look at it again. I've seen you walking in the truth. I want God to say that about me. How would you like a writer inspired by the Holy Spirit to say about you and your family, I've seen you walking in truth. I've seen you walking in love. I've seen you walking in the commandments of God. And if I've done that, what else do I need? And then, the rest of the book. This is going to seem like the complete opposite of this, what we've been talking about. We've got some warnings in verses 7 through 11. For many deceivers have gone out of the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine... Do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. How does that jive with what we've just read? These people are hospitable in the first part. These people are loving. They do things for other people. Those things that we talked about. What does walking in truth look like? What does walking in love look like? What does walking in the commandments of God look like? Emptying yourself. Doing for others. Putting others first. Feeding the hungry, feeding the the widows and the orphans, helping and taking care 
of one another. We've seen that looks like, but now we're told if somebody comes into your house and does not bring the doctrine of Christ, don't receive him, don't bid him God's being. And this is the part, unfortunately, that is most known about this little book. We know that verse well, don't we? Verse 9. And it's a great verse, and, and it's needed, verses 9 and 10. But how does that jive with what we've just read? Talking about the fruit of the Spirit, and looking like Jesus, looking like uh, we're walking in the truth. Well, Brother Woods again says this, John does not forbid hospitality to strangers or even to false teachers when, in so doing, false teaching is neither encouraged nor done were we to find a teacher known to be an advocate of false doctrine suffering, what would you do? Don't read the rest of it. What would you do? Somebody who is a blatant false teacher and he's made you so mad because you know that he is just, he knows better, he should know better. You see him with a flat tire on the side of the road, what do you do? You drive by and honk. <laughs> you stop and you help him, don't you? We'll see a little bit further. It would be our duty to minister to his need, provided that in so doing we did not abet or encourage him in the propagation of false doctrine. What is forbidden is the reception of such teachers in such fashion as to supply them with an opportunity to teach their tenets, to maintain an association with them when such would involve us in the danger of accepting their doctrine. It's difficult when somebody that once stood strong for the truth leaves the truth. He's no longer walking in truth. He's no longer walking in love. He's no longer walking in the commandments of God. It's difficult to keep the right attitude about those people. Do those people need the truth? And who's going to teach them if we don't? Who's going to remind them of the love of Christ if we don't? Now then, what about if they come in there and said, hey, I want to teach a lesson at your house tonight. Would you invite some people in? What would you say? No, we can't do that. And you and I both know why. You see something from this passage, hopefully tonight, in these, first, these few verses that we've studied tonight. Hopefully we've seen some things. And I want us to just remember that question that we asked once again, how does your spoken truth compare to your lived truth? I think there's a sermon right there, fellas. How does your spoken truth compare to your lived truth? In other words, how does your life jive up to what you say? Well, I told you we might not get to 3 John, and I kept my word, didn't I?